early to mid 90s there were several companies out there that included Creative Labs, Microsoft, and of course the infamous uh, Apple, who had created the actual Apple iPod, decided to go out on a rant of competing against MP3 players. And I happened to get not kind of suckered into it, but I wanted to get a little MP3 player for myself a long time ago when I was working in Montreal. And I had actually gone to our local big box store and actually picked up way back in 2007. And this is this is the one that I had picked up. It, this one here is actually the Creative Lab Zen, which is about two, three and a quarter by two and a quarter by a half inch thick, almost a half inch thick, uh, a mobile mp3 player this one here happens to be a uh, what they call a multimedia player from creative labs themselves and yes you can see the reflection of myself in the screen uh, believe it or not this thing still does work to my surprise I had it all these years I had actually bought it in 2006 2007 remember if memory serves me correctly and there were several different types of Zen this particular model of Zen, it had, it's using um, NAND flash memory uh, to store the actual MP3 files and video files on this. Uh, sizes range between two gigabytes, four gigabytes, eight gigabytes, sixteen gigabytes, and thirty-two gigabytes, which is the last model that they had for this particular Zen model. And nice little LCD screen with uh, of course little buttons here to uh, control where you're going with volume control and power on power off uh, this here actually has a nice little feature here which is a micro SD card which is which uh, permits you to actually transfer files from your computer over to your uh, mp3 player here. this is one of two ways the other way was through the connection here on the side this little guy here this is actually the charging port and also the data transfer port so you can transfer it directly from your computer whether you're using uh, at the time uh, you know the Mac operating system or the Windows operating system uh, at the time when I had the uh, when I was using this the most in 2007 Windows XP was still out so you had a little application on your computer at, uh, at your desk where you can actually transfer files and it would actually basically load it into the into the uh, NAND flash memory here. Now, believe it or not, this still works after all these years. Uh, I've actually charged it up uh, within the last couple of weeks, and it works still. Believe it or not, it is still functional. Well, let's get it up and running. We'll take a look at it as it boots up. Now I have to get my other hand here out to be able to pull it open. To turn it on and there's a sliding little thing there on the side to power it up there's creative it takes a, it takes a little bit to get it up and running not the fastest one but hey heck for an mp3 player it does the job now this is the main menu of the Zen itself which gives you a couple of options here um, let's start off with the basics. It ha you can also record your voice on here. There is a built-in microphone on this. You can store some photos. Of course, play some music. I don't have any photos as of yet on here. So it's like no pictures showing. So let's go back out. Uh, recently browsed. And uh, we have music. Let's go into there. Click on OK. Playlist. Okay, it's not that great, but I do have a couple of albums on here, which I do listen to, you know, Lionel Richie, Mariah Carey, and uh, Janet Jackson there, Rhythm Nation, and I basically use this for my walk still, believe it or not. This is one little, tough little guy that I had uh, while going, 
and you can play some music and here's some subcategories like video that you saved onto here TV shows Zencasts uh, video wise it gives you a list of uh, what has been loaded onto it and some of these are really good songs that I like listening to and uh, some of them are recent and some of them are really really old and you can see on the side here there's alphabetized A through Z TV wise I don't think I have no TVs in there Zencasts see serious wheels and see this here is marked in 2012 when those were recorded and all that and probably brought into here uh, what else recently browsed nothing else there let's back out and it also comes with an FM radio this here is great if you know especially when you're using your headset your earbuds or headset for listening to the music and you can actually listen to some of the you know you know selected presets that you saved on here I don't remember how to do that exactly but I was able to save a couple of channels uh, extras like a little calendar feature date and time and organizer and this is this is where we this little section here for the memory card this is where you can actually uh, stick in a two or four gigabyte SD card and be able to read off it and pour you know import them all depending on the uh, depending on what you have on there if you have also imported the uh, pictures and the information about the SD card itself now here's a nice little section here which is systems here we're just going to take a look at the information setting uh, information about it so it's creative Zen version 1.210 um, total space is close to four gigabytes space available which is about uh, close to three track count six so to uh, 64 sorry so there's a total of 64 files on there seven album counts playlists video count 21 copyright 2007 patent pending okay that's no normal uh, this is your audio settings and yes, this is all done by this little menuing system here. Uh, at the time when this came out, uh, this here it was actually if memory service correctly. I paid about a hundred dollars or something like that uh, for this four gigabyte model. So it's actually a good little system. It keeps, and I'm like I said, I'm very surprised as I kept this in fairly good uh, condition uh, for a hundred dollars. I cannot, <laughs> I cannot complain and it's very compact you can put it in your in your pocket whether it's your pants pocket or shirt pocket uh, so long as you have easy access to it the one thing I like about this here as well this was a bonus for me and uh, knowing how well knowing myself because I usually have a lot of things in my shirt pocket and instead of having it be you know instead of having these uh, pads being pushed by accident with the stuff in my pocket there's a locking feature so right now it's unlocked and if I want to lock it I just push it up and it shows on the screen a little lock a little locking uh, padlock on it to show that it's actually locked this part here so this here won't move while you're listening to your music which I love because especially when you want to listen to something while you're walking it does a really good job and just to give you a comparison here I'm just going to turn this here off whoop okay let that shut down just to give you a size comparison with my measuring tape this how is how big the me in comparison with the measuring tape is thickness wise you can see it is a lot smaller than my typical measuring tape but it does the job you know it does what I need to do see side by side it's a great little it's a great little thing there um, creative had actually uh, had other models of this this here is the Zen and I'll provide a link down below in the description uh, for the other ones that are that were available or were made from creative themselves uh, 
I'm going to be keeping this one for sure for the next little while because I do a lot of walking, like I said, uh, after my work and all that. So this here is for sure a bonus part for me. It's a lot better than carrying tapes and all that. So let's go on to the next little, little fun stuff that I have to show you. Okay, where to begin with these? Oh my god, these are so ancient. These I remember when I was younger and going through learning how to program computers and bigger things. In case you're wondering what this all is, these three things. This is what we used to use before broadband internet actually came up. This was actually used uh, either one of two ways. Uh, this was actually used from the early 70s, 80s, 90s, probably a little bit today in the extreme cases depending if broadband internet is available. Of course these things here, if you're not too sure, this is what we called analog modems. This is what we actually use the telephone for when using good old computers. They came in two, two variants. External ones, which is this box here, this guy here. That's the back end of it. Let me put that around properly, which I didn't do. You have either external modems or internal modems. They ranged going back since the early days. Uh, both external and internal internal modems, they ranged from 300 baht, which is extremely slow, uh, and they went as high as 56k modems, which is these two here, and they also had external 56k modems, not like this one. They had various forms of external 56k modems, but there was the two kinds that you can use. These things used to use way back before uh, things like Mac OS, uh, Mac System 7, OS 10, Windows 95, uh, 98, 98 Second Edition, uh, NT, all those where everything is graphical. They, you used to use an application in DOS. Uh, which is a telecommunication program which actually which actually controlled these things, both external and internal. So depending on how your computer was configured up, either one will work, depending if you had an external modem or an inter internal modem. Now the biggest difference between these two here, the external and the internal, the external ones, this one here happens to be a Gandalf 2400 baud modem, which is actually a little funky one here, which is a cool one by the way, which I liked. Uh, originally it did run at 2400 baud, but with uh, the setup internal, internally on the telecommunication program or within the operating system itself, like with Windows uh, 95, 98, you know, all those ones there, if it was able to get detected, you can actually use what they call the throughput which basically tells the computer how fast to send the information to the modem itself. Like in this case for the Gandalf, uh, it was a 2400 baud modem, but you can also push it up to 9600 baud. So it was able to connect a 9600 baud with a little compression application that was built into the hardware or the firmware of the, com of the modem itself. And this, here one, this one here actually connected externally. Uh, this here is just the front part where you see the lights. The back side, which is a DB25 connection, and this here, the, the serial cable would connect to this, and on the other end of the computer, to the computer itself, you would either have a DB, DB9 connection, which is the smaller serial connection, or a DB25, depending on your computer, uh, ranging back from the original XTs, which had the 25 pin. Uh, some XTs did have the 9 pin, uh, more later on, like the 286, 386, 486 Pentium line of computers had the 9 pin or the combination 9 and 25, and you had your 
power supply here, power cable here, and one for the phone and one for the line itself. So the line would be the one that the receptacle on the wall itself, the other one you can hook up the phone to. So it would actually, when you needed the phone, it would actually pass through here if you're using the same connection. Uh, this here is a great little, great little modem, which I've used on many occasions, especially on uh, mini, mini computers and certain IBM, um, larger IBM systems for the office and it came with a nice lovely little manual here. Uh, not many modems came with manuals, some did. Gandalf was one, US Robotics was another one that did come with a manual where it basically told you how to configure the modem itself. Uh, it also gave you know specifications and some what they call is command uh, command uh, where is it delimiters here we go some of the command commands for the initialization string for the modem itself so when you actually powered on the modem itself you would plug it in some had little switches on the back side of it this one doesn't have the switch but this one when you had it powered on you would load the application itself, uh, like uh, Telex, which is a famous DOS one, which you can go up to 56K modems without a problem, um, like these ones here. Uh, this one here uses, uses the standard external serial port, which is great, because that is a true compression with the UART chip that was built into the motherboard itself, or the connection in the back for the serial port. These ones here, or this one here is particularly these ones here that I have for the internals. I don't have my older versions of these modems. I did have at one point where they had ISA, ah, if I can open it up properly, um, I had ISA versions of these. Let me just excuse for the closeness of the tie wrap. Some of these modems here, they had ISA versions of this which actually had the built-in UR, uh, UR chip onto the, onto the PCB here, which were actually true modems. These here, this one here, uh, from this guy here, and TP-Link, uh, they were called wind modems. For the simple fact is, is that they required a driver to have the operating system detected, but not only that, uh, since there was no what they call as a UR chip, which is basically a, uh, a chip that did the directional conversion from digital to analog and from analog to digital. So it's translated on the fly between the computer and the wall. Uh, the, the software actually did that for here, for these ones here. So these ones here I consider as wind modems uh, in that respect. The fun thing about these things, and this is just for nostalgia purposes that I still have these three around. Not many people have seen these, especially the newer, uh, the newer generation of kids, because they're so used to having high-speed internet via DSL or via cable modems. And when you introduce them to these, something like this, where myself, being that of the older generation, had these around, even to access the internet, was fairly slow in comparison to the DSL and cable, high-speed cable modems. Because for the fact is, the limitation of the analog itself was only 56K down when you had these 56K modems. 33.6 uh, up for sending to your service provider. Now the strangest thing about these things is that it's only the 56k part of this, these two here, or if you have an external one, is your 56k is only for the download and the maximum you can send upload or up to uh, the service provider was 33.6 if you had a 56k modem. Now there were other variants, uh, other modems in different sizes. Uh, this one, like I said, this one here, the Gandalf, which was capable of 9600, which is no good for the internet. But they had others one, other ones where you had 14.4K, 14, 14 
22.8, 33.6, and then you had these ones here, both externally and internally. Now, I wish I still had another one of my US Robotics, which was another form factor of the externals, but they also had the two combined, and you can use either one. Now, with the internal and external modems, these ones use what they call as a communication port or a COM port. Uh, most of today's modern computers do not, no longer have these COM ports available on the motherboard. They would have been, uh, nowadays if you needed to use like an external modem, you have to buy the card separately and hook it up that way uh, and then be able to use it. Uh, these ones here fit into the standard PCI slot and it's just a matter of installing the driver for it and then telling the computer in the background to configure uh, what they call is a not a void but a like a to create a link for your service provider and then you can click on that log in it would get assigned an IP address and you would be able to still dial in to your service provider and be able to work with it now we're gonna I'm gonna say this and I can say I'm spoiled rotten when it comes to the current connection which I have is just the 30 down and 1.5 up if you would compare that to this, or these two kinds when going on the internet, are extremely slow. Now, just to give you an, an, an idea, to download on a 56K modem, let's say a, a 1 megabyte file, would take close to about 14 minutes. A 1 megabyte file, remember that. If you were to download on high speed internet, or broadband, which is the DSL or cable modem. Again, depending on your connection, if you have 30 down, one and a half up, or whatever the speed may be, it's a lot quicker. But these ones here, I still keep around just for nostalgia purposes. I like using these, thing, these things here just to show off what we had available back in the early 70s, 80s, and 90s, and the early, two, and the early 80s, 70s. These things were great to have and fun to play with. I used to do a lot of bulletin board systems, which is plain text, and you saw it being written on the screen as it went down, and there was no graphics at that time for bulletin board systems. It was all character-based. Nowadays, with the Internet, everything is all graphical. Pages load fairly quickly, depending on the, depending on the speed you have. I love these things, just for nostalgic purposes. If you ever have a chance of getting one of these things and hooking it up and testing it out and connecting to an actual bulletin board system, you'll understand how far we come uh, when using the high-speed internet and comparing it to these things. You'll have more of an appreciation of using the internet the way we use it today. So let's go to the next one, next nostalgia thing here, and we'll have some... Okay, last but not least, for this little bit of retro wear, here I figured to give you something a little extra special. In case you're wondering what this one is, this here is actually a USB uh, TV tuner card from ATI All in Wonder. This one here is actually uh, connects to your actual computer, whether it's a uh, desktop or a laptop. It's an actual TV tuner card where you can record and watch TV, uh, TV directly on your computer. And you can record stuff on it, like TV channels, or if you're doing some recordings like off of a VCR, they give you a connection where you have your left and right audio and your video recordings on it. So you have that connection there. Uh, this here is still usable on an earlier version of Windows, like Windows XP. Uh, the drivers for Windows Vista 7, 8, and 10 do not exist for this. So this is actually an older version of a modern-day TV tuner card that you can still get under the PCI, uh, PCIe or PCIe Express uh, connections for your computers these days. I've used this a couple of times myself, and it records really well. Uh, when I was using Windows XP and I was connecting uh, connecting a couple of TV shows to it I uh, wanted to see them on my TV and how well it worked and it works fairly nicely I bought it for about 78 bucks 
Here's another one that you're not, you're not going to find that often as well. Let me pull that one here out. And this one here is a, PCMI, a PCMCIA Smart TV card. It does the exact same thing as the USB one. Just to put it in comparison. And this here is just for the laptop. Comes with uh, RC uh, coaxial to uh, the regular RCA pinout. Put that aside. Comes with a cheesy little remote to change channels. And it comes with, you guessed it, RCA plugs, which is your video left and right. This one here connects on the side which is like a, an old 5 pin DB connection for recording via RCA and this is the other one which is basically uh, your antenna. So off the air uh, connection for wireless wireless TVs. Uh, like the old, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the rabbit ears that uh, people used to have on their TVs when it was black and white and also on certain color ones where you didn't have uh, a coaxial cable to connect to your TV directly. They would have something similar like this but rabbit ears on top of the TV. Uh, this one here I have not tried out at all. Uh, my last laptop that I had, uh, which was a Windows uh, laptop, actually died. So I didn't have a chance to test this out but it's still working as far as I know. Uh, most modern day laptops do not have this type of connection anymore which is the PCM and CIA slot due to because um, people like it smaller and lighter and uh, most people don't want to have a DVD player on their computer so they eliminated those two out right from the get-go and these ones here I would definitely keep around uh, especially when on an older laptop the demands of this, believe it or not, are slightly higher, and I can still show you the box for it. Uh, Spec application software system requirements: CPU Pentium 4 1.8 gigahertz or above operating system Windows XP, DirectX 9C or above, 128 megs of RAM, CD-ROM drive, and 600 megabytes of available hard disk space or above. Most of today's laptops you have them in the gigabytes but for the recording part of it which uh, does take quite a bit of space uh, depending on how, on how large the file is and especially if it's on a 4x3 format uh, that will definitely take quite a bit of space so uh, as you can see here it even mentions Pentium 3 as the bare minimum but uh, for optimal performance, uh, the 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 higher the faster the CPU, the better it is. And guess what? I only paid this, yes, nine bucks, and this was a few years ago. Uh, this is one of those ones that I definitely will keep around to show my kids, or anybody who ha hasn't seen something like this uh, for a laptop. And I wish I did have a laptop to show you this with and this is just for Windows based PCs uh, if I had this one available for a Mac which I, do, which I don't of this smart TV card I would probably have used that there to show you what it would look like on that one but because this here is just a Windows based version uh, good luck in finding it uh, for an old PowerBook G4 anyhow that's it for my review of retro reviews I hope you like it Give me a thumbs up if you like it. Give me a thumbs down and comment down below what you thought about it and what I could do for improving some retro stuff. Catch you guys later.